So, hello everybody. Uh, I was in the audience earlier on, so I know the radio quality with which you can hear me. And I'll, I'll make one admission before we, before we introduce our speakers, that as a 15-year-old, I wrote a letter to Melvin Bragg saying that I'd very much like to succeed him in, in our time. I think since then, sort of 20 or longer years later, I've lost the hair that would qualify me for that and never really had the erudition. So this is the closest I'm ever going to get to a radio presenter, and it makes me very <laughs> pleased. So we're here with SJ Turp and Major General James Bowder to talk about social media battlefields. So how we could use open source intelligence to protect democracy. And SJ, to my right, is a data scientist. She's been working at the forefront of misinformation and disinformation with governmental and international governmental organizations for quite a number of years. She's worked within government in the past around autonomous systems and is fresh from working on standards between the European Union and the United States last week. So it's wonderful to have you here, SJ. And then we have Major General James Bowder. James is Director of Futures in the British Army which is responsible for determining where the army should go and how, probably the more difficult bit, how to drive change within a historic organization toward that end point. And James previously served in Northern Ireland and Afghanistan. And critically, perhaps for us, before his present role, he was commanding officer of 6th Division, which is responsible for information operations, psychological operations, intelligence, and so on. So it's great to have both of you here. Thank you for joining us. I'll frame a little bit around social media before we then ask SJ and James some questions. Firstly, if you think more about this question of contemporary social media in the battlefield around the history of media rather than perhaps the history of war. So if you think back to the 1940s, we had in the United States an extraordinary propaganda film called Why We Fight, which was originally, originally conceived to educate US service personnel as to why they were going to battle in Europe, but was so successful that Eisenhower spread it out to the members of the public, and it was shown in cinemas, and is probably one of the most remarkable early internal propaganda films explaining war uh, that I think we have on record. And then if you fast forward to the Vietnam War, obviously the media, particularly the print media then, was instrumental in the United States in a lot of anti-war movements and changing the dynamic of, of how that war was understood. But then if you fast forward to the first Gulf War in 1991, we have the French, French theorist Baudrillard positing whether the war really happened. And this was not to say that the violence in, in Iraq was fake, but more that the media representation was very different from the traditional understanding of war. And that the media arch arch artifact was heavily curated, it was co-opted by the US military, and what was seen of that war was a surgical war with intelligent missiles and very clean. Now, Baudrillard's comment was this was much closer to a simulation of war, that there was a great asymmetry. You had the United States basically destroying Saddam's Iraqi forces very rapidly with air power. They never really met on the battlefield. And that it felt much more to an audience like a computer game than it did real war. I think with Ukraine, we have something that is, again, very different. So with Ukraine, you have democratized access to the media production. You have a war that is much closer to us geographically. It's people who look like us on our doorstep. And you have all of the combatants within that war fighting almost a separate social media war, which looks very, very different to a war of attrition on the ground, which is much more symmetrical than, say, that Gulf War that Baudrillard was talking about. So it is much more a battle of, of artillery, it's a battle of maneuver, it's a battle of logistics, something which feels much closer to the Second World War than that intervening period that probably shaped most of our generation's understanding of the battlefield. And that battle for narratives is now global. It's what the academic James Dadarian talks about in his virtuous war books, 
that you have the local media and the global media creating this notion of, of uh, modes and networks of observability where the affect of what is said in social media could very well prolong or exacerbate a war as much as it has a possibility of perhaps shortening or protecting democracy. And so, SJ, you've been on, in some ways, the front line of the social media aspect of this. What, what are you observing in, in the war in Ukraine and social media? I think it's not just Ukraine that we need to look at. Um, there is social media activity in Ukraine, in Russia, um, in the Middle East, in um, the rest of the world. There, we ha we look at a set of things. Um, we're looking at the harms, so we're looking at what types of disinformation, what types of rumors, what types of misinformation. Disinformation is deliberate, but it isn't always false. The falsehood is not in the content. Um, we're looking at things like conspiracies. And we're seeing reuse of a lot of old things. Um, we talk about the war in Ukraine as though it's recent. Um, Russia has been invading parts of Ukraine for nearly a decade now. They have had equivalent activity against Ukraine in social media. Um, so running um, narratives to, to harm Ukraine, running narratives to harm Ukraine as a country, the, the concept of Ukraine even as a country, the concept of its language is separate. Um, and they've been doing that for almost a decade too. In some ways, it's one of the oldest social media conflicts there is. Um, although having said that, um, propaganda is as old as humans and warfare. So a lot of this is forever. But we're seeing these different sets, these different places things are coming from. Um, Russia obviously has the Internet Research Agency. It has hundreds of people who can dedicate to this. But we're seeing different narratives aimed at different places. So the narratives going into Ukraine in different regions of Ukraine are different to the narratives that are being played to Russian people, are different to the narratives that China is using. So China is using narratives about Ukraine internally that are different from externally. Uh, again, you have uh, all sudden narratives in places like India. And, and these are all geopolitical. So um, you know, disinfo, you see drivers, um, money is often the driver, you know, people making money off things like um, health events. Um, you, you see political drivers for things like elections, but you also see this country to country geopolitics. And this, this is nothing really surprising <laughs> at, at the moment. Um, we've seen a few things that were expected. Um, so this idea of hybrids where you have um, cognitive, so cognitive security, the study of uh, misinformation, information, disinformation, harms, and response to them. Um, so you have cognitive and cyber supporting physical, um, cyber supporting cognitive, etc. So there's, I, I think it's more that all the things we thought were going to happen are now happening what uh, about in the, one place. the Western reception of that? Are we deluding ourselves that we're, we're winning the online battle? I, I think... There are many different battles. Um, we, it felt almost cathartic um, that when Russia overtly went into Ukraine, um, the hacking community could just go for it. Uh, I think people have held back for a very long time. Uh, one of the questions I asked last week was, am I competent? Uh, in a space where anybody can respond to cognitive social media events. Anybody can respond to cyber events. Um, less people can respond to physical, so you actually have to get there, but uh, at, at which point do you have a sense of what is allowed and who is involved and what are the rules around those people? 
So there, there's a lot more questions coming. And uh, when you interact with, say, government or intergovernmental communities versus the hacking community around standards and coordinated behavior, do you get very different responses from both? Not really. Um, there is a need to share information. We built ways to share information. And it, it's needed and used, if it's needed and used. There, there are different styles of cooperation. Um, there, I would be lying if I said there weren't trust problems. <laughs> So a lot of this is how do you work? I mean, some of the people involved, uh, the groups involved are large organizations like Microsoft. So getting large organizations plus international bodies, plus governments, plus hacker communities to trust each other, work together. That, that's quite a feat. But we, we've got things like the ransomware task force is a good model for that. So it's coming, it's coming. And talk to us about the ransomware task force. Uh, th this is a group, and I'm not going to say who's behind it because I will get the name wrong, um, <laughs> but it's, it's a community started I idea to coordinate across all the people affected by and able to respond to, to ransomware. It it's been picking up quite a lot of noise in America because the government got involved in this. So do you welcome government involvement into sort of online collaboration and, and so on? Because usually there's been antagonism between, say, traditional internet communities and, and the feds that we were talking about earlier. <laughs> uh, we were talking about spot the feds at DEF CON. Um, so you'd think, but really, when are bad guys? Um, you want to do the thing that makes makes the harms work less. So I do work with people who are not keen on working with um, governments, but equally I've had a government official, an anarchist, and a business person in the same room working together. So it depends. I haven't seen it so badly. I mean, mostly it's about how to coordinate. I wonder if when it comes to war, part of the part of the difference is the, the reduction in ambiguity. There is clearly good and clearly bad. It's also about who. Um, there's a war happening in Europe, in a country. It is very much a sovereign country. We, we can't just like turn up and go, hey, we've come to help you and do everything instead of you. There, there are already extremely good groups, both in the country and in the surrounding area. So um, Stop Fake and the Baltic Elves do very, very good work on disinformation response. Um, they've been ripping apart Russian disinformation with humor for a very long time. And it would be a disservice to just turn up and go, hey, we, we know better than you do about your situation. There, there's a concept of um, pro, so um, Heeks, Richard Heeks had this idea of levels of help um, from pro which you just parachute in and decide everything for people, um, to working alongside each other, so para, um, so it's basically co-working, to grassroots that you then support as expert. And, and I am very much a fan of grassroots work you support and working alongside, not just we've come to help you. So, so but, James, as a, as a Fed, uh, you've just heard SJ talk about her being a combatant, like participating, and people like her, in in war, but in a way that, frankly, is not going to be commanded and perhaps not even controlled by by people like you, as a professional soldier, is that a problem? Uh, whether I thought it was a problem or not, I have no agency, right? Uh, what we've got to do is respect the information space. What we can't do is try and turn it into something that it isn't, right? Uh, and equally, there need to be appropriate safeguards placed on the activity of actors on both sides of the, uh, of the conflict to ensure that 
um, the input of the civilian participants is, you know, is you, that, that discourse is appropriate, right? And that people aren't put unfairly in danger. I mean, I think what's, what's fascinating, I mean, I see there being two obvious manifestations of uh, so f social media in, in Ukraine right now, and I think that would play out in future conflict. The first is the one that, which is, I think, the most catalytic, is the one that uh, SJ has referred to, uh, this notion of uh, changing sentiment, right? I mean, we say that, you know, maintaining what we call campaign authority uh, as militaries is, is one of the key determinants of campaign success, right? Particularly in, in Western liberal democracies. Um, the adversaries are less constrained by that if you're going against a regime like, China, uh, like, um, like Russia, um, but still it's a challenge for them when the excesses of their folk uh, are captured in such a visceral way as, for instance, the events in the sad events in Bukha. So, um, what social media can help uh, nation states do is bolster their own campaign authority, but also seek to have at the adversary's campaign authority by exposing their missteps uh, and uh, and excesses. But I think the other side of it uh, is that which is arguably, in some respects, more eye-catching. Um, so extraordinarily catalytic impact of changing sentiment I, in terms of the Western consensus achieved in terms of supporting Ukraine in those early hours and early days of the campaign is in some respects you know, it, it moved the campaign forward quite significantly in Ukraine's favour uh, for quite some time. But the, the, the more eye-catching side is, is what we routinely do when we scroll through whatever it is, Telegram, Twitter, um, and some other channels where we see uh, publicly available information uh, being cited routinely, which has a whole bunch of different payoffs. Some of it in, in, in impacts on sentiment, uh, but some of it clearly can be integrated by one side or other in order to target. Right? I mean, if you think about how targeting on a battlefield has happened through time, it's I see a military sees something, but also it hasn't always been military. There's also been people in the pay of that military or sympathetic to that military pointing something out. But the fact it's never been quite as real time as one can achieve now. Um, but, but to talk about the risks of this, um, to what you talked about combatant or not, if somebody is taking a photograph and uploading it, to what extent do they become a target? And one of the things I think we're seeing in Ukraine or have seen is civilians being targeted. Uh, those holding uh, uh, an iPhone have been targeted uh, by the Russians because the assumption has been that they are, um, they're taking photos that then could be exploited from a targeting perspective. And equally, I describe this as eye-catching, but it isn't catalytic simply because when a photo is taken of a military a piece of hardware, that is but a start point. You know, one can't take hard and fast action against that uh, unless you confirm it in a rather more easily to validate and rather more reliable way. But moreover, imagine how it can be spoofed. You know, on a future battlefield where the public have the means of communicating enemy action and enemy intent, uh, a smart enemy is going to flood the information space with photos of tanks, uh, at every road junction or in places simply where they aren't. And so therefore, this inevitably is a double-edged sword and it's the extent to which uh, the members of the public are unwilling participants or un, uh, you know, that they don't understand that they're being used by one side or other. So if I pick up on something you said then in terms of smart enemy, I mean, at SJ, we were talking a little bit earlier around the practitioners of, of disinformation and at the moment that it may not be quite a high standard of required in order to be effective. Do you think that's the case? I, I think, I mean, we design things that are a lot smarter, but basically if you're creating disinformation, you don't need to do anything that clever. It, it's relatively simple steps, it's relatively simple, repeatable work, uh, because it still works. Uh, until the point at which we have responses that counter and counter well, it, it doesn't need to be anything more. So yet yeah, in the back pocket we have designs for worse stuff and responses to worse stuff, but not yet. I mean, one of the things I said was that the people creating disinformation are smart enough to know not to be too clever. <laughs> and, and obviously part of the, the title is to protect democracy. 
are, from your experience of the tradecraft involved, the techniques involved, are there activities that we as members of the public can undertake to make it harder for people to spread disinformation in particular? Uh, there are many. Um, one of the things is to be more resilient to disinformation. So there are some lovely games out there you can play to get a sense of what disinformation tricks look like. Um, there are some good websites showing you um, tricks, examples, um, counters, narrative counters. So uh, if a disinformation narrative goes out, to be able to talk about um, what the actual thing is. So I work elections sometimes, um, simple things like if somebody puts out, hey, you can vote using your phone. Having a, okay, these are the ways you can vote and phone isn't one of them. Very, very simple counter. Um, improving the information space. So I've worked in some countries where there are beautiful, beautiful websites with lots of information on that people need to see. But nobody sees them because they're on beautiful, beautiful websites. They're not out in social media where the disinformation people are. So you need to go where people are looking. You need to go where people are sharing. You need to be in that space and clear and just build better information spaces. And we'll, we'll go to questions in a minute, but I'm going to ask James in, to reflect in terms of the present position as, as in charge of Army Futures. Mm. Do you have people, soldiers, coming in who already have the pre-existing skill set that SJ is, is hinting at, or are you having to train them up to be more resilient themselves to disinformation? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the army uh, very obviously mirrors society, right? So uh, we have the same challenges, but also the same opportunities uh, that exist uh, amongst the cohort of 18 to generally sort of 30 or so year olds. Uh, and so therefore it is increasing resilience across the piece. But I mean, um, the, the, the awareness or how adept at using information that folk uh, in their 20s are, vice folk in their 40s or 50s is, is quite striking. It's not universal, um, but they're certainly easier to teach and instruct and actually we'd learn a lot from them as well. And does it matter as much as those of us who have been commentators saying that there need to be more digital skills in the armed forces, has Ukraine actually shown that it is less important than some of the traditional military skills? Or is there still, does there still need to be an emphasis on it? I mean, I just think, I think some of the discourse about uh, cyber in Ukraine is missing the point about um, all armies are increasingly digitalized, right? Which increases the attack surface. Uh, that the enemy has access to, right? I.e. armies that are more digitally integrated are inherently, uh, they have a challenge with resilience. So uh, it's not either or, it's as well as, right? So you've got to do good old combined arms maneuver using every tool uh, uh, to which you have access. But combined arms maneuver in the 21st century absolutely has digital at its core in order to protect one's networks, battlefield networks from RF weapons weapons and RF attack, um, but also to go extraordinarily hard at the enemy's kill chain as well, their automated and integrated kill chain. Brilliant. I think that's a, a good segue into, into questions. There's going to be a microphone roving for anyone who's brave enough to put up their hand. I think we've got a, a gentleman over here. Thank you for your patience. a member of the younger generation what can be done for somebody my age and especially a few years younger because especially with the pandemic and the UK Ukraine crisis I've seen a lot of my peers and a lot of people a few years younger than me really be swayed by things they've seen on social media but especially for people my age who are not following like proper news sites they're getting information off second or third hand sites and it's becoming an echo chamber of like one, one stream of opinions. Is there something you can do as people that are working in the field to help educate people my age into spotting disinformation and knowing where to look to find like the truth? It's not always about truth. Sometimes it's about um, feelings. 
Again, with disinformation, you can use true stuff and amplify it to the point where people get angry. Uh, um, some of it's designed to split communities, to, to make you think there's somebody other who's the enemy. Uh, the games, again, uh, Bad News Game, Harmony Square, uh, Cranky Uncle, they're all fun to play. I have a list somewhere. Um, I, I would try those. Just um, And also, when you see something that makes you angry, makes you react, take a second and say, is that real? Um, maybe tell your friends who are sharing it that, you know, that's not real, just t take it down. It's, it's going to take a while. I mean, your generation is the first that's completely linked together. And that means stuff just comes like storms across, across your channels. But we'll get there. Yeah, play games. And James, have you played Cranky Uncle? Sorry? Have you played Cranky Uncle? No, I haven't yet. Um, but I do look forward to it. I do look forward to sort of uh, trawling through SJ's list. I've got little to add other than the, uh, just to cite the truism that uh, an eminent general in the Second World War, Field Marshal, uh, the Lord S Slim, uh, suggested that no news is ever quite as good or as bad as it first seems. Uh, so having, retaining perspective is important. Uh, right the way through the age groups. I think this, this does pose a significant issue for, for social media in particular in terms of verifying and validating news sources and using algorithmic processes to perhaps champion those rather than that which may be most, most popular or most noisy. Um, it's a difficult moment in the evolution of, of social media in particular. There's certainly some interesting work on making recommender algorithms, so the things that say, hey, you like these things, you'll probably like this thing as well. Um, transparent, so we know what they're doing, um, and we know whether to opt in or not, and ultimately to argue with whether these should be, be because part of the problem is that things that make you emotional, make you share faster, which makes the eyeballs, the clicks that you do, which makes money for adverti from advertising, which it's, but that is just part of the solution. There are many, many pieces to work on. And I think one of the things we have seen from your organization as the Ministry of Defense, James, is a willingness to publish, admittedly for the strategic interest reasons, but a willingness to publish defense intelligence, I think daily updates on what Britain is observing and its allies are observing are, is happening on the battlefield in Ukraine, mm. which is, a, I think, a brave change compared to how government, mm. particularly the Ministry of Defense, has been historically very reticent to participate in social media. Yes, I think up to a point. But as, as I think SJ introduced at the beginning, I mean, propaganda is old as, as, as war itself. So therefore, uh, nation states using information in order to achieve an influence effect. So um, therefore, uh, I would say that this is just a, a, a contemporary manifestation of uh, achieving, helping to uh, bolster campaign authority, undermine that of the adversary and achieve a political effect. Because after all, war is, remains stubbornly political. Thank you. Next question. The gentleman here. Thank, thanks very much for the, for the talk. It's been really interesting. Um, you talked about some of the, you know, the implications of disinformation, both in, in social media and on the, on the battlefield in terms of campaign. On the one hand, and on the other hand, you've got the AI and ML communities furiously creating like generative models, which can, you know, at the flick of a switch and at the click of a finger. You know, create incredibly misleading information, and um, you know, and open sourcing that <laughs> those models on on the web. So, I mean, for a start, is there? Could you comment on that? And also, is there something that the machine learning community can do? To is that actually helpful, or can we do something to help as well as <laughs> put our models all over the place for people to pick up and, and create pictures of tanks wherever they feel they might like to put them, kind of thing? So, there's a couple of things going on in there. Um, I'm not as worried about deep fakes as you might expect me to be, partly because when you have a piece of disinformation, it, is, it has content. So the thing itself, the image or the video or the audio, increasingly more audio, and it has its context. So what is connected to this? What does it mention? What else, if I put out a net, design a network, is, is in the network around it? And 
quite often with things like deepfakes, the content is credible, but the context isn't. So it doesn't take too much to debunk one. Um, one interesting thing is bad deepfakes being used to reduce the credibility of all images or all videos in a space. And that's something we've seen in Ukraine. So as a person who designs machine learning algorithms <laughs> also, um, I, I think having more emphasis on explainable AI helps uh, as somebody. Um, you, looking at, because we're looking at context, so um, graph theory, network analysis helps a lot. So I, I think the epidemiology models we have post-COVID are wonderful. Um, when I started doing this, I, I'd say epidemiology and nobody knew what on earth what I was talking about. So you can now track things spreading and how they spread. You, you start seeing structure like um, super spreaders, so influencers, <coughs> where if the information hits them, it then spreads out further. But being able to, to pinpoint those pieces of the network where you can have an effect and how you can have an effect. I think as yeah, machine learning to machine learning, that would be a good thing to do. I mean, Esther, you, you said content and context. Yes. But if we can go back to the young man who made the first mm -hmm. question, aware of the content, but probably not aware of the context. Yeah. And so does that not, not concern you that people won't have that ability to, to discern? Well, people are not uniform. Um, and whilst somebody may pick up a piece of disinformation, especially if it reinforces a view they already have uh, and use it to reinforce that view, um, they may also pick up a piece of disinformation and find that somebody has already debunked it or already talked about those sources. So there's the context includes the response context as well as the disinformation context, it includes the other information context. So yes, it's bad, but I don't think it's going to be like that forever. A temporary blip, perhaps. Jake. Yeah, I mean, if I could just make the, 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 the perhaps obvious point that uh, war is a contest. It always has been and it always will be. Uh, and therefore, it's a two-way street rather than a one-way street. So as uh, ML and AI um, perhaps contribute uh, with ever greater sophistication to misinformation or the spoofing of sensors and decision makers. Uh, I guess we have a responsibility to contest that, right? So we have the responsibility to actually work out the extent to which AI and ML can be used by democracies to call out uh, obvious nefarious behavior and spoofing. So it's actually fighting fire with fire, not being in any way fatalistic about the enemy having an asymmetric advantage, just the opposite. Actually use our best minds uh, to put their shoulders, collective shoulders, to the wheel uh, to ensure that uh, Western democracies and Western democratic values are able to face down the challenge. Um, I, I would say if you're really interested, I would look at the field of MLSEC, Machine Learning and Information Security, because they've been doing some really interesting work on adversarial AI, uh, which I think extends well to adversarial cognition. So moving that, so if you see the machine beliefs and the human beliefs as um, similar to each other, you're, you're just freaking one or the other. Um. I think that there is also a trend which one hopes is beginning to change, and perhaps Ukraine has accelerated some of that, where in the past, and particularly those on the west coast of the United States, have an extraordinary naivety when it comes to politics, and even more so geopolitics, that a lot of the contemporary tech world is led by those who were born and grew up in that wonderfully a wonderful but sadly short-lived emancipatory period of the internet and what has come since whether it's solely because of capitalism or other geopolitical dynamics is not that and so including many more people who are politically astute within the actual engineering community would be a great advantage and i think europe in particular is 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 showing some dividends there next question over here Hi, thanks for a wonderful presentation. You mentioned, I guess, building resilience in democratic states and even in more contested information spaces like Sub-Saharan Africa, or India, or Latin America. And 
When it comes to developing these, I mean, you can't just begin when the war begins, like the lesson of Ukraine kind of taught us that, but to what extent do you see, I guess, and this is directed at you as well, James, civil society and kind of the role of these networks and building robust context in terms of fighting disinformation and the spread and of these bad narratives around these spaces? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a profoundly important question you ask. And in terms of our response, uh, of course, it isn't just an armed forces defense or security community response, as you suggest, it's a game for all the family, right? And I think what good looks like already exists in the world. Uh, I think when you see how hardened the societies of, let's say, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are, how hardened the societies are, um, and how they approach in, uh, uh, resilience uh, in Finland and Sweden, and to an extent Norway too, I think we get a, uh, a very clear sense of communities who feel like stakeholders in the enterprise. Uh, and I guess we might well see, given keeping the peace in Europe will be more challenging during the 2020s than perhaps uh, it has been in the recent past. I think we'll see more and more nations uh, place a greater premium uh, on the involvement of citizens. I mean, there's some really interesting writing on this. I mean, I don't know if you're um, familiar with the work of Elizabeth Braw, uh, who's talked a great deal about uh, national resilience in the context of Sweden, for instance. Um, so I think we're increasingly clear of what great looks like, but we've just got to make a collective decision about the extent to which we uh, move towards that goal. No, I think when we talk about communities, um, we, we're not talking about uniform population again. This goes way down to the level of faith communities, to um, towns, cities, um, down to people who are linked by whatever subject. Um, it, it, it works well there. So as one of the WHO infodemic team, um, we worked with faith communities um, on how do you strengthen the information environment um, and how do you respond? So wh what we saw, what we thought about um, disinformation as was part of communication. So communications work increases trust, disinformation reduces trust. So you're talking about different types than the most dangerous one, I think, is a disinformation that attacks the system, uh, attacks the how people believe democracy works, how people believe their community works. And they're at that level, you're definitely looking for community influencers. And they may be the town clerk, they may be the librarian, um, they may be your faith leaders, but they can help shut down things very quickly. I think that's so. a, an optimistic and inclusive moment to end on, that we all can and do have a role in, in protecting democracy online. Thank you, SJ. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you.